Now, where was I going with this? Who said Eber? Peleg. Not peg leg, Peleg. Do you have those pictures? What does it look like? Well, don't worry about evolutionists and what they say. You know, they, but we do know something that science does see that at one time the earth was one landmass. The Bible agrees with that, folks. The scriptures I'm giving you in Genesis, when I get through here, are going to prove what happened. Remember what I'm trying to tell you today? Where did the races come from? I haven't lost my place. Do you see this up here? Do you see what it looks like today down here at the bus? It's hard to see, isn't it? But slowly the land masses begin to separate. You can look at geological maps of the understructure of this planet, and those fault lines are all over the place, folks. They're all over the place. Those fault lines. And with a you know that un, you know do you know that under the Mount of Olives is the earthquake fault? They've taken pictures and you know what they got what do they call this thing, Don? I always say it wrong. Infrared, yeah. They've taken infrared shots of that area and there's an earthquake fault line running right under the Mount of Olives. Can you tell me, let me see, let's do a little Bible study. Can you tell me when is the last time there was an earthquake under the Mount of Olives? Can you tell me from the Bible when that happened and it can be proven from geology? Nope, not Jesus' cruci crucifixion at all. Nope, Mount of Olives is still intact. When is the last time there was a major earthquake? What book of the Bible talks about it? And what king was on the throne? No. No. Book of Amos. And who was king? Uzziah. Now, if you go over to Revelation... No, I don't want to go to Revelation. No, I want to go to Zechariah chapter 14, verses 1 through 5. If you, go to, if you go to Zechariah chapter 14, verses 1 through 5, it says, the day of the Lord comes, and all the saints come with him. From where? From heaven. To where? What part of the earth where the Mount of Olives is? So how do you know that? Because I have to tell you about prophecy. All that prophecy is, is history that is written in advance. You study history, would you like to know the future? You have to go to a fortune teller, you have to go to a seer, you have to go through some diviner. It's in your Bible already. Zechariah 14, 1 through 5. The day of the Lord comes and all the saints come with him. And when his feet you could read this for yourself right in verse 5. And when his feet touch the Mount of Olives, there is an earthquake not having been seen since the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And that is recorded in the book of Amos. So when the Lord comes back, there's an earthquake, and it tells you how big it was. It isn't just a little tremor, folks. It isn't just a little uh, jolt. The earth divides, and there's a great valley all the way to Azal. Look at your maps and find out where Azal is. It's north to south, east to west. The waters of the Mediterranean rush in to meet the waters of the fresh waters coming from the earth. There's a huge Grand Canyon formed. Hey, guys, that's a big bang. Boom. Now... Since we know there's an earthquake fault today from science, and we know there's an earthquake fault that has caused an earthquake in the past in the book of Amos, then we also know there are tectonic plates that have shifted. Is that not correct? What happens in California? Is there, are there plates that are shifting? 
And when a plate shifts, there's a, it drops. And there's a earthquake. Now, if you go back and you look, and you, you don't have to go back to this map, but at one time the earth was one landmass. Now, in God has always been stuck with created beings that don't like him. God has always been stuck with beings that he created that wanted their own, wanted to be gods over themselves. God has always created beings that were rebellious and sassy and, and tried to remove the knowledge of God from the earth. Nimrod was one of those. And you can read this in Genesis. Elohim, or God, looked down and they saw that man was trying to remove the knowledge of God from the earth and become gods. And Elohim said to somebody, I, perhaps it was the father, let us go down and confuse their tongue. Do you remember that? Let us go down and confuse their tongue, lest they become all that they've planned in their hearts to become what? Against us and our purposes for mankind. Now, that means you had groups of people on this landmass, all one big landmass, that all spoke a common language. I don't know what it was. It probably was Chaldean. Who knows? Who cares? The point is this. Is that, do you think God is all-powerful? Do you, don't you think that the God who created us is also a God that can change our genetic code anytime he pleases? There's a part of God that's not taught in Christianity like it needs to be. We know that God is omniscient. We know that he's omnipotent. We know that he's omnipresent. But have you been taught that he's also omnificent? You won't find the word omnificent in your Webster's dictionaries any longer, but it is in the older ones. So if I was a scholar, I would take omnificent out of there because it only applies to God. So if I want to remove this knowledge of God from English language, hey, I'm just going to remove the whole word and you know how to study it. How that? That's pretty smart, isn't it? The word omnificent means ever and all creative. Ever and all creative. When you read in the New Testament, and you look at the gifts of the Holy Spirit that the Father wants to work with his sons and daughters, of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, one is the gift of miracles. Have you ever read that? Then there's a gift of healing. What is the difference between the gift of miracles and the gift of healing? Why would there be two different gifts that God wants to use his kids to help others? One, the gift of healing, the gift of miracles. Because God knows what he created. Do you know there's body parts that you have don't heal? That's why they have organ transplants. Very little evidence of neurogenesis. Very little evidence of, of uh, uh, automatic replenishing of nerve tissue and brain cells and all that. So if you're going to represent the Father as a work of the Holy Spirit, and somebody has a body part that won't heal, what, which of the gifts do you think you need to operate in? I do. I have. And the Father has worked with me and formed body parts out of nothing. And it's proven. Now, I'm not bragging. I'm just trying to make a point. So he's trying to make a point. So don't, because I want to tell you where the, where the races came from. I'm getting there. Slowly. So would you agree that God didn't lose his ability to create? Would you say that God hasn't lost any of his God abilities? Very good. That's why the Bible says, those that say, yea, Lord, I love you, Lord, but deny the power thereof, get away from them. They're dangerous to you. Those that teach that healing passed away the apostles 2,000 years ago, get away from their churches. 
their death churches. You can quote me if you'd like. Because they offer a God that's powerless apart from salvation. That's silly. It's garbage. So, back, back to this little subject again. Take me back to Genesis. In the days of Nimrod, God came down and confused her tongue. Do you know that God took people groups and he gave them another language that was different than the language that they had to begin with and they didn't know, they had, they didn't know it had changed? He said they couldn't talk to some people they used to talk to yesterday. Say, is that possible? It happened. Where do you think languages came from? It would have taken millions of years for language to evolve at this level. So it's not evolution. It is the creator. Now, why did God confuse their tongue? I'm going to give you a scripture in a minute. Well, I'll give it to you now. Well, maybe I won't. Well, I'll give it to you now. Then I'll go back to my point. The scriptures say that God dispersed, dispersed the people across the face of the landmass that were rebellious against him and his purposes for mankind. That in the fullness of time, this is New Testament, that in the fullness of time, what's the fullness of time? In the future, he may regather all all peoples and languages and races and tongues back to himself under Messiah worldwide. We're in this time of the formation of this now. Messiah isn't here, but the calling of these people to become sons and daughters of God has been ongoing for quite some time. Would you agree? I'm a son of God, whether you like it or not, by faith. Who are you? You're either a son of God or you're a son of the devil. I don't mean to offend you. It's one or the other. And your daddy is not a monkey. I love these DJs. In Oregon a few years ago when I was listening to him on the way to a conference. And the guy was talking about evolution. He said, we came from monkeys. Yeah, we came from monkeys. Yeah, 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 yeah. Why well, this thought? Yeah, what's that? Well, if we came from monkeys, as they say we did, how come we still have monkeys? I think that's a legitimate question, don't you? I'm not a son of a baboon. I'm not a son of a monkey. I do scratch occasionally. So don't you. But it doesn't make you a monkey because you scratch. Once God had changed their language, now you have to understand what we're reading here. For in the days was the earth. Say earth means the planet. The word world means the people. You look up here, look up your language. World means people, cosmos, Greek, people, mankind. The earth is what? The dirt, the planet, whatever we are here, this globe. So what does it mean in the days of Peleg, the earth was divided? It means the land masses, once God dispersed the people on all the land mass, and that would have been a migration. It took about two generations for this migration to occur. Pastor, may I add something? Yes. I looked up, um, since you're doing a baby dedication, I know you love to get into to baby names. And um, Peleg, if you drill into it, means earthquake. So you're, you're calling your son earthquake. Come here. Well, uh, I call my son earthquake. He was an earthquake before I named him Peleg. Yeah. And then his brother's name, Jotan, Jotan, means to make smaller or to diminish. So dad, by the spirit of God, you know, is, is having to actually paint to those around him. This is what, you know, God's influencing. And he, he makes, he moves on parents to actually name them for a great purpose. And so for these two sons, the earthquake to make the landmass smaller or to, you know, to break up through earthquake is very specific, very intentional. And I just wanted to point out the two names that were, was built right in there. Um, 
Now, I want you to get this picture because I'm going to hurry now. I'm going to get finished. You got the land mass. The people have been, have been dispersed on the land mass before it began to drift, the continental drift. Once the people were in place, separated by language, and were in these parts of the world, that's why the people that were part of uh, Nimrod's rebellion with the juggernaut, they would have ended up over in where? South America. That's why they brought, they brought the mysticism, they brought all of their, all of their stuff, through the generations, they talked about this great juggernaut. So, but they hadn't turned to God. So when they ended up in the generations over in the Mayan culture and down here in South America and into Mexico in that area, they brought the lore of their culture. That's why it's not really a mind bender to see why you have it in more than one place. You know, you may not know this, but St. Peter's Square is in Washington, D.C. The Washington Monument is what's in St. Peter's Square in Roman Catholicism. What you don't know, and I won't go because of mixed audience, what it stands for. I'll let you do a little word, a little study on your own privately with your children. To realize that the, that the Washington Monument and the, and the monument at St. Peter's Square is made under the worship of Hermes, a mythological figure named Hermes. Now do your study in your web searches as to the personality of this mythological god named Hermes. And that's what you have in Washington, D.C., what it stands for. It's his symbol. No wonder America is breaking down sexually. I'll say no more. The issue is this. Now you got the people separated by landmass and by language. Then God came and did what? Tweaked the genetic code. The only difference between me and you, well, let's see. You're a different color than I am. I noticed. But you're not different. Those out here that don't understand have made you and me different. The only difference, it's okay if I use you as an object lesson, you know I love you. The only difference between me and you, there's only one difference, other than we could have a, a different, we could be the, uh, from a different uh, family tree of, of uh, Noah. It's okay. It had to be from somebody. But the only difference, my friend, between you and me is, the, is your genetic code in the pigment that causes light to be reflected. That's it. All that skin color is is a result of how much light is reflected in the pigment of the skin. That's it. Is that enough to create division? Is, how, let me ask you a question. Do you have houses that have more than one color in your house? How dare you have a house that's more than one color? Shame on you. And you have the same number of pigments. So what is this, an argument over pigmentation? Well, I think my pigmentation is superior to yours. Really, are you the creator? Well, if your pigmentation is superior, then why did you go out and get a suntan today? How dare you mess with your pigmentation? That's so silly. In the days of Peleg, God divided the earth by language and created the races. And here we are today. Not far away, how many years? Barely 4,000. That's not enough time for races to be developed. If evolutionists were correct, it would take millions of years to create the races out of the common genetic code in its change. It shows you the fallacy of man's ignorance and the accuracy of God's word.